Welcome to the Treasury Update Podcast, presented by Strategic Treasure, your source for interesting treasury news, analysis, and insights in your car, at the gym, or wherever you decide to tune in. The Treasury Update Podcast host, Craig Jeffrey, kicks off a new series featuring interviews with Treasury and finance leaders, exploring challenging situations, fresh ideas, innovative approaches, case studies, and recommendations from senior Treasury practitioners. These stories from the front provide a transparent look at various industries and challenging situations that provide insights and wisdom to help guide the profession into a proper mindset and approach as we continue the path of recovery. On this first episode of the Stories from the Front series, he interviews Leanne Perkins, Assistant Treasurer of Ion Geophysical, to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on the oil and gas industry at large and her story of how they have navigated this disruptive event. Listen in to the conversation and learn some valuable lessons and useful insights. Welcome to the Treasury Update Podcast. This is Craig Jeffrey, and today's episode is part of our series, Stories from the Front. And today we're looking at the oil and gas industry, and I'm joined by Leanne Perkins, who's Assistant Treasurer at Ion Geophysical. Leanne, thank you so much for joining me on today's podcast. Thank you, Craig. It's always great to talk to you and to talk Treasury, especially in these turbulent times. (laughs) It sure is. So as, as... As you know from the stories from the front series, we look at the impacts on different uh, industries and the most recent disruption is this COVID, Um, you know, COVID's impact on the oil and gas industry. If those who are in it obviously know about it uh, (laughs) deeply Um, and those that aren't, maybe it's like, wow, it's a lot cheaper to uh, to buy gas (laughs) nowadays. (laughs) Maybe maybe we could just talk about, uh, you know, what happened and how severe is this uh, impact on the industry, the, the COVID uh, impact and its ripple effect through the, uh, the economy in this uh, industry vertical? Sure. And so it has been quite difficult this year. You know, oil and gas has gone through many years of turbulence. That when times are good, they're really good. But when they're bad, they're extremely bad. So this year, as everybody knows, has been quite difficult on March 9th. We experienced the intersection of where COVID hit the oil price crisis. And oil prices fell at one point by 30% to the lowest it had been in 18 years. So of course this was very dramatic for a company like mine in the oil and gas sector. And we're upstream, so we get hit the hardest, we get hit first and we take the longest to recover. So as a company, ION had very strong Q1 numbers but the impact was definitely felt in Q2. We had about a 46% decrease in revenues compared to the same time previous year. And at the same time, our customers were impacted by commodity prices and the macroeconomic events of COVID. So this obviously impacted our revenue as well. And like many of our customers and competitors, we experienced significant layoffs some furloughs and a quite dramatic 20% salary cut. So, you know, it was, it's been pretty difficult times and our immediate need was cash preservation. So this included a lot of cost cutting measures such as the salaries and also cost control with the vendors. And there was a lot of negotiations having to go on at that time too. And then at the same time, our customers significantly reduced their capex spend. So it's been a difficult time all around and we uh, hope it gets better pretty soon. <laughs> yeah, certainly and and those are those are some uh, you know dramatic numbers. Uh, it's pretty easy to adapt to a 5% change, but uh, yeah. <laughs> 20%, 30, 40, 50% is um Impressive uh, numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, you can't just say we're going to stop uh, traveling or whatever, but uh, right. Leanne, one of the things I was, I was hoping you'd do for the, the broader listening community, not everybody's an expert on the different elements of upstream and downstream in oil and gas uh, and where Ion Geophysical sits. Maybe you could give us a little bit of an explanation of the sector and then and then maybe we can talk about um, you know, a little bit more about 
you know, how your, your part of the sector may have differed from others that other, other people who are listening may uh, be expecting or have experienced. Sure. ION is a technology focused company and we concentrate on select growing segments within the $400 billion exploration and production markets. So therefore that means that any oil price volatility affects our revenue directly in the exploration sector. So our customers are predominantly the large exploration and production companies, the Exxons, the Chevrons, the Shells. And as ION, we're in the complete upstream process. So we start right at the beginning where oil is searched for, you know, in the depths of the oceans. For us, we have to rely on the capital budget spend of the E&P companies. And of course, this means we get impacted by commodity prices along the way. The customers, they have a lot deeper pockets than us. They're much bigger companies and they have a lot more diversification than we do. So they have a bit more time to adjust to the commodity prices and the, the macroeconomic events. So a lot of the time when the oil and gas sector is hit, companies in the ions, geology and, and software sector get hit first. And we're waiting on our customers to recover before our projects come back online. So we're more of a, what we call a luxury business. If the you know, pricing drops or the demand drops significantly, it, it cascades upstream you know, at a faster rate, um, you know, three times whatever, two, three times faster, shutting it down, and then it has to open up or thaw yeah, before the capital goes there. So, you know, what if they can pause projects immediately or stop activity? Yeah, correct. And our projects are quite long term as well, as you would imagine, with, you know, doing the, the seismic work and, and finding the, the pockets. It, it takes a couple of years, so it's not just a quick project in and out. For ION Geophysical, then what, um, you know, obviously you, you experienced that being in the position upstream in the market with the, the tightening. Um, what have you done uh, maybe from a strategic perspective to diversify or reduce the impact of these, you know, first a downturn and last to come up uh, model of, you know, where you are in the, in the economy in this, uh, in this industry um, sector? Yeah. So fortunately, our C-suite have been looking at diversifying the strategy for quite some time now. So because we tend to be disproportionately impacted by these events, we've had to, out of necessity, become an asset light company. So the strategy change over the years has enabled us to be able to pivot quite quickly and to really actively explore ways to diversify revenue. And we work with some very smart, highly intelligent scientists and um, geologists and who come up with these great ways to build software for adjacent markets. And these are markets such as offshore logistics, military and marine robotics. So fortunately, the company has been able to keep to this strategy and we've been able to somewhat mitigate some of the near-term impacts to the bottom line and to the cash position. You know, we basically have to actively work on diversifying the revenue streams and to remain a low-cost company with a, with a low-cost basis. <laughs> That's interesting. I, I, I didn't know that there was a sector called ro marine robotics, but, um, you know, it, it, there's, there's obviously some overlap uh, skills Yes. That can be a transfer. That's great. They really are. It's a very interesting environment. Obviously, I don't understand the technical side, but there's a lot of cool stuff that goes on underwater. <laughs> well, and, and let's, you know, since this is stories from the front, um, you know, we've been through, you know, we're well past March. We're, you know, we're almost into September. You know, we talked a little bit earlier about the the response um, very early in the in the mix on another on another podcast. Uh, but I'd love to get an update on, you know, what, what you've done early on and then what's, you know, what's perhaps changed over time as you've adapted to this, you know, this ongoing challenge, um, you know, facing your industry and, and your company. 
Yeah. So early on, as we had discussed, you know, the immediate focus was obviously on liquidity and cash preservation. So immediately, like a lot of our competitors, we drew down on our revolver and we began working on a lot of different sensitivity and scenario modeling to ensure that we didn't bust any covenants by borrowing additional funds. So we had definitely a much greater focus on forecasting and this was more frequent turns of the cash forecasts with longer horizons. Now that hasn't really changed since March. I think that's going to be something that's always important in this industry until there's a real recovery. But right now it's a continuation of cost control, cash preservation, and just making sure our forecasts are accurate and we're able to predict scenarios that will come back at us. Because you know there's a lot of information out there. There's there's a lot of positive people and then there's a lot of negative people. So you're never really sure where the industry is going, how things are going to turn out. So we've got to just be prepared for what potentially could come our way. And we also at the beginning, you know, took advantage of the many global government relief programs that were available to the company. And these were very helpful in terms of cash injection. I will say that they were sometimes very cumbersome processes, especially in the US. But we're very grateful that the government has these relief programs for our industry and the global teams really stepped up and we got all this done quite quickly in line with the liquidity focus and the needs of the company. You know, moving forward, what we've been able to do is to just make sure that we continue the, the cost control process. And of course, the company is still very much focusing on the customer needs. We're still focusing on innovation and improvements and to just really try to find those adjacent markets where we can have diversified revenue streams and to just, you know, make sure the company still is able to ride out these difficult times. So we unfortunately still have the salary reductions. We still have the furloughs. But I think, you know, in this industry, We've been through it so many times when when things are bad, we know we all just got to huddle together. We got to get the work done as we always have with fewer people. So I think that just eventually drives innovation and efficiencies, not only on the operating side, but also in support functions like treasury and finance. So you just got to look for those opportunities. It's it's not always rosy, but it's what you make of it at the end of the day. How coordinated is this? Uh, you know, obviously, Treasury has a role. The C-suite has a role. Other parts of the business have a role. Is this, uh, you know, highly coordinated, or are people um, operating on their own and then then coming together? How how is that working? You know, I think we're a very lucky company because we have an incredibly collaborative workforce, and that really stems down from our C-suite and also from our board. So. Our CEO has weekly coffee session or virtual coffee sessions with every lead from each department. And so some of them are very technically orientated sessions and others are just general states of the economy and states of the company and others are very finance focused. So the whole company is invited to any one of those virtual coffee sessions to ask questions. Um, the CEO and CFO are always available. So I will say it is extremely collaborative. It's not to say that everything always goes right all the time, but I think we have excellent leadership and support from not only our board, but from our C-suite as well. And I think that drives down to the various functional and operational departments to be able to work together and to help steer us through these turbulent times and I think you know the company's been in existence for 51 years as a as a, um, a business so I think they've they've learned over the years how to navigate these tough times and what works and I, I think from my perspective and the people I work with collaboration is always how we've gotten through some of these more difficult times so I think it's a it's very much a case of you know be open ask the questions and it also helps I think to reduce fear and concern from the employees because there's nothing better than hearing directly from the top so the message is not lost or misunderstood along the way. Yeah, good communication that that's 
some good examples there of uh, how you're working on that. But, you know, Leanne, as we, well, as you talked about, you know, what happened at the beginning and then, you know, through the later stages so far um, of how you're adapting, what, what are you looking out for on the horizon that there's going to be, you know, recovery or something freeing up or additional actions are necessary? Um, wh- what are you, what are you watching for? So from the Treasury side, you know, we're always watching the government programs. So there's a lot of collaboration between our banks and our advisors on, you know, what the government in the US and and various other countries are doing to help our industry. So we're watching for relief, basically. But we're also watching those global financial indicators, such as the Fed's fund rates. And, you know, what does this mean for us as a company with our interest rate risk and our foreign exchange risk? And so in order to get a really good overview and to have the information disseminated in ways that is useful for the company, we do actively engage with our bankers and other experts in those areas. And then I think it's also really important for us, and especially on the operational and sales side, for us to look at our customers. So engaging with them to know when their CapEx budgets are coming back and you know when we think we'll be able to start programs again. So I think that's much more of an immediate indicator for us. And then also watching our competitors. What are they doing? What are they not doing? What are they running into that we should perhaps, you know, be aware of? So it's very much a, you know, a holistic look at not only the industry, but also the government and finance side and and how we can protect our company. And um, specifically on the treasury side, you know, we're obviously very engaged in risk management. So that's actively monitoring credit risk customer risk, counterparty risk, and sovereign risk. And so we're watching how these risks can impact the the industry as a whole and specifically us as a company. And then just a little bit more broadly, we're also looking at some opportunities worldwide. So one of the the strategies of the Treasury Department is to future-proof the company. So, you know, where we can as as a department. And so in terms of pivoting quickly to other markets, you know, we we never know where we're going to be working as a company. It could be in a country where we don't have any bank accounts or any ability to transfer funds. So one way to help to future proof is to make sure we have relationships with our existing banks worldwide to quickly be able to add bank accounts if we need them in in a certain area. So we're trying, I think, to pad as much as we can for what's coming at us from the horizon. Sure. You know, just shifting a little bit to uh, the concept of, you know, learning. What have you learned through this process? I'll ask a few questions together. It's really one question, uh, but this may get you, you know, answering in different ways. You know, as you've gone through this, what was the what was the scariest thing that um, that you've you've seen or that uh, you guys experienced? What what went well? And then, you know, I also want to make sure you circle back and, and I'll ask you about that too, but is, was there something you wish you had in place or had done differently or more thoroughly that others who are listening could learn from? So maybe we start off with what was the scariest and what went well? So I think the scariest thing for us was, at least from the finance department, was how do we close quarter end in a public company remotely? So the first quarter end was about 20 days after we all were sent home to work at home. So it was pretty nerve wracking to <laughs> to make sure that everybody was communicating correctly and the work was being done and everybody knew what to do to get the quarter closed. And we really shouldn't have been afraid because it was just like working in the office. We got everything done. It was a very successful quarter close. So I think once we all got over that and we got feedback from the board and the auditors that everything went well, there were no problems and nothing to be concerned about, I think it gave us a lot more confidence to get through the next month end and we've just finished our second quarter filings as well. So it was pretty scary to do all that and to also manage the cash and the liquidity at the beginning. But I think, you know, we just had the right processes in place 
to be able to get it done and just once we got the fear out of our way we just kept working and forging on as we always do sure you know there's there's a flow of funds and there's and keeping employees safe and you know you know moving from home work you know you already described a little bit about the working on quarter close but this um you know the extended business continuity plan test if you will um you know there's the human factor and you got to keep the the business flowing side of things right and so you know keeping the employee safe was obviously the number one requirement and concern of the company as a whole so we all got sent home on, on March 9th and about 95% of our workforce is still working from home. And there's about 5% who are essential there in the, the buildings around the world. But fortunately, we have a, a very good QHSE department who are very strict on the controls. They're very up to date with what needs to be done. And nobody goes into the office without all the required PPE and you know, following the protocol. So I think we've been very lucky that employees have been safe, but it's also attributable to the protocols that the company's put in place. So that's that's been important to us. And then also, you know, I had previously spoken to you about our business continuity plan and living in Houston, you know, hurricanes are something that come at us pretty often. Looks like we're getting <laughs> two next week. <laughs> so, well, obviously it's 2020. So, <laughs> but so we've, you know, we've had our business continuity plan in place. We've tested it during the hurricanes, but you know, those have been, I think three weeks was the longest we've ever been out of the office focusing on, uh, you know, remote working. So now with COVID, I, I think it's going on almost six months already that we've been out of the office. So we were able to to put it into place on day one, on March 9th, when we all left. And it's worked perfectly. It's passed the test since we've been at home. So I'm very grateful that those processes were in place and we were able to use them without skipping a beat. And, and the processes still got done and the funds still flowed and fraud was prevented. So I'm very grateful for that. And I think last time I had mentioned to you that I have that little saying that risk management is the process of sending solutions down the road to meet you when you need them most. And I think <laughs> COVID I has that. I love that one. Yeah, it's, yeah, like I mean, it's one of the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> and COVID has definitely proven the need for this approach. And fortunately, it's um, something we had in place a while back and has worked out well for us. Yeah, that's, that's great. I know when we um, spoke the other day, um, you had talked a little bit about your annual goal. And I was wondering if you could talk about the, the goal because it was about working with the department to manage shocks. And, and I was just wonder if you could uh, share some of that because I think there's a lot that can be, you know, learned from, you know, at least that approach and some of the concepts that, that you laid out. Sure. I hope that my goals are not jinxing this year, but <laughs> at the beginning of the year, obviously I didn't know any of this was going to happen, but one of my goals for the Treasury Department was to work at building an anti-fragile Treasury function. And that is, in essence, to manage internal and external shocks that come our way. And we don't always know what these shocks are going to be, but history has told us they're definitely coming at us. So you might as well go and prepare for them. So I have four pillars that support the quest to be an anti-fragile Treasury function. So I can just run through those quickly, if you like. And the first one is pivot quickly and communicate simply. And this year has been one that has proven the need for this process. And so our staff are always being asked to concentrate on different areas. Our strategies have changed. The board's focus has led to different requests coming our way. So in order for us to do this well and to meet the business objectives, the department has to be agile and we have to ensure that we can all get up to speed quickly to meet these deliverables. And so to do this, I think, you know, management must be clear in their requirements and hence the communicate simply. So communicate to us simply, communicate to us often and ask for feedback. So that's one area. And the other area is anticipate change and acknowledge uncertainty in a world of disruption. And boy, has this world this year been very disruptive. So risk management for treasurers is obviously very important. We have that focus on 
liquidity risk, on credit risk, and on market risk. So anticipating change means that the Treasury Department strategy has to have a clearly defined decision-making framework. And so when a crisis such as this year strikes, you have guidance for specific scenarios as you manage different types of risks that come up at you during the year. So that's proven helpful to me. And the third one is trust the process. I mean, that's a, an age old saying that certain fundamentals do not change. If you stick to the game plan and you track to the baseline, you can always manage any variances from there. And so I think the fundamentals to me are that a treasury department should always work to demonstrate good governance, good risk control and compliance. And then the fourth one is lead by the causes of risk and not by the symptoms. So to me, it's the understanding that risk doesn't respect organizational structure and therefore your solutions that you put in place have to be global in nature. And that's absolutely run true for, for this year where everyone in the, the ION offices around the world have been somewhat affected by, by this pandemic. And you know, when I wrote these goals, I was focusing on areas such as financial risk and regulatory and technology risks. And obviously I didn't envision what's come our way, but I do think, and I'm proud of the way we handle these events purely because we have robust processes and strategies that were already in place before the crisis and the teams all stepped up and have the skill sets to manage. And I think, um, you know, just to end that section off is to say that the devil is in the detail, but the success is in the strategy. So I'm, I'm proud that we put that in place and it seems to have worked for us so far. And, and it has good alliteration there too. So yeah. um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I like the, the way you, you phrased it instead of saying become resilient you said it slightly different. You say move to an anti-fragile environment or, or build uh, an organization that's anti-fragile. Um, Makes which you is, think, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it changes. <laughs> yeah, it changes the way you think about it. It's like, hey, I don't want to break. Yeah. Uh, not just that I want to bounce back, but I don't want to break. And yeah. it's, you know, both of those are are helpful. And I and in your second point in particular, you know, anticipate change. And what did you say? Recognize uncertain. We're, we're in an uncertain world, or yeah, in a world of disruption. Yeah, acknowledge the uncertainty. Yeah, yeah. And and while you may send uh, send you might send certain solutions down to ro the road to meet you when you most need them, they may be specifically addressed to things, or they may help provide a type of response, um, even if the situation is different. Like uh, you know. I thought we were going to all be back at work after Easter. Yes. And then it was it's like, it's like uh, not not in 2020, you know, we're not yeah. going to be, you know, every, everyone's going to be staffed there. So certainly uh, some issues there. You know, as we move to final thoughts, I know there's more content that you, you may want to share, but what, what are some of the things that you've been thinking about um, that you want to, you know, just talk about or that, that may be particularly useful or helpful for, for others? So I think, you know, and I know a lot of industries have faced the same issue, but it's very um, dominant in the oil and gas sector because we're so global in nature. But one of the things that I really wish I had done earlier or even thought of earlier for a goal for the year is to work on international trade and collection of funds in an automated and digitized manner. And so we really struggled this year with trade finance. So we use a lot of letters of credit for our exports. And during the, the most difficult time of the crisis, we were trying to get our outstanding AR paid from an international customer. And we had this letter of credit out there, but because the banks were all closed and the company was closed, the FedEx with all the original paperwork sat at the bank somewhere <laughs> for, <laughs> for over I'm two I'm sorry, months. I'm laughing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny now. <laughs> then it was tears. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, unfortunately, letters of credit are still so far behind. Everything has to be original. You have to have wet signatures. And of course, there's this whole um, time and expiration issue to, to a letter of credit as well. But 
it really tripped us up. And it, of course, you know, it was the largest amount of AR we were owed. <laughs> so it became a real problem for the company. And we tried all sorts of things like trying to factor the funds and all sorts of creative solutions, which did, didn't work purely because of the country we were working with. But, you know, I know that there's banks who have the digitized blockchain letter of credit trade finance program out there. We just don't have that yet. So I know that you have to work with your banks and they have to offer it. But I really feel like if that we had been able to work on that early and I would thought about it as being just something way more important than it is, we could have prevented such a big issue for a good couple of months. So I think it's there, there's some things that you just don't always think about being an issue if you're not in the office. But this one was was quite severe for us. So I think if I could do everything over again, I would have worked with banks to get us a, a digitized blockchain LC program in place. <laughs> you know, I think the issue of um, the analog processes, there's always greater risk than we expect because they tend to work well in a fairly well in the normal environment. And then when things go bad, they go really uh they go really bad. Yeah. So good story of, of, of adaptation there. I know you have a uh, debt that's uh, LIBOR based. You have um, other things that are happening and any other thoughts to uh, share? Even in these really tough times, you know, we're, we're being asked to do a lot of different things, but we have to remember, you know, as employees and as team leaders that there are other day to day operational needs that have to be adhered to. And especially in a public company, you know, fraud never sleeps. Socks and internal controls have to be adhered to. There's reporting, there's monthly close, there's letters of credit. So I think it's important as to always remember that, you know, you have to make sure your deadlines and your requirements are done, but you also have to make sure nothing slips. So I think the way we manage this is to always start with the end in mind and keep pointing the team to the end goal. There's a lot of little things that might trip you up along the way, but it's the end goal that's important. And I think with us in the company and, and in the treasury team, this helps to provide direction. It helps stability during these tough times. And it also, for me, I find that it helps to keep energy levels up because you know that there's something achievable and attainable at the end of all this difficult work. So. You know, it's um, just finding ways to navigate those unforeseen challenges. And like you mentioned, you know, there's a lot of other things that I have to focus on right now. It's the LIBOR transition, both from the debt side and from the deposit side. And this is a very long and involved project. And it, it takes a, a lot of team members and a lot of different departments. But strategically, it's really important. And it's something I must fit into the schedule. And so I've learned that, you know, now more than ever, you have to have good time management skills. And I think you have to speak up too when you see difficulty approaching either for yourself or your, your team members are facing it. You have to speak up. I've learned it's not a sign of weakness. And one of your boss's jobs is to help remove obstacles so that you can focus on your highest and best use of time. So speak up when you can and, and when you, you feel the need is there. So Leanne, your plate is uh, certainly full and I know you're doing a lot. Um, what, el what else are you doing with your team to help make that effective or any other actions that we can learn from? I, I think one of the ways is to not forget about training your staff. And, you know, it, it just seems like in the past couple of years and in difficult times that training seems to be that perk that gets taken away when you're busy and everything else has to get done. And there's not enough time and money to do training. But I see it from a different perspective. I think training is mutually beneficial for the company and for the employee. And in these difficult times when you have furloughs and cost cutting, I think this is still a good way to prove to the employees that they're valuable to you. And it's a, it's a small way to help to motivate them as well. It's good for their career progression. And there's so many ways that you can train the staff for free. And so I think you have to be able to give the staff and yourself too time to listen to podcasts. I would definitely recommend the Strategic Treasures series. <laughs> you have to, for sure, you have to, you know, use your banks because they offer webinars and they offer advice. And there's, there's so many ways that 
you can still get trained without having to spend a lot of money. It just takes a creative mindset and it takes really motivating and asking your staff if this is something that will help them. So, so don't leave out training. I think, you know, we're all busy. We all have other things we should be doing, but I think training pays back dividends for years to come. Yeah, some great points, Leanne. Thank you so much for uh, sharing, uh, sharing your stories from the front on uh, this podcast. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Sure, and you know, wishing everyone well during these challenging times. And I say, look for those opportunities in these difficult times. And Treasury is born for turbulence, so enjoy the ride. reach the end of another episode of the treasury update podcast be sure to follow strategic treasurer on linkedin just search for strategic treasurer this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and statements made by strategic treasurer llc on this podcast are not intended as legal business consulting or tax advice for more information visit and bookmark strategictreasurer.com